So you have your participants. You know, you figure out how many you want, and you are already going. By the way, the magic number for your projects is written on the statement, but it's two to three users. Okay, that's bare minimum. Uh, and you do know that the ideal is four to five, but I'm not expecting you to do such mass evaluation because that's very costly. So two to three is your golden number for the projects, not for real uh, thing. So you have your plan, you have your environment, you have your participants, uh, you're almost ready to start. Before you start, there's something else that you should do, which is make sure that you have all your materials ready. You will need a lot of documentation and some papers that you want to bring with you to the evaluation. To begin with, you want to have, if you're going to have any kind of prior orientation, and you are going to have them, at least you're going to explain the scope and purpose of the test, you do want to have some pre-written text for that. It doesn't matter whether you're going to explain it out loud or you're going to hand it out to the user so that they understand what they're about to do. You do want to have that. Why am, am I saying that you are going to be doing that for sure? Well, if you're going to record that, at the very least you need to inform them that you are recording and you need their informed consent to be recorded and then to have this used for research purposes, and you want to have all that text made standard. If you're going to have some screenings, you need to have them printed out and ready to be filled in. Uh, your tools to collect the data, your camera, your notepads, your whatever you're going to be using, your prototype in good working condition. Yeah, kind of obvious, but I've seen all kinds of things. Uh, the tasks and the scenarios that you're going to request the users to go through, doesn't matter if it's a list of tasks or just an open-ended scenario, have that written down, and whatever you need for your final interviews. Have all that stuff ready. Why do I have a point about this? Isn't this common sense? I have a point about this because one of the great challenges in doing user evaluations is recruiting the users and convincing them to sit down and do your user test. And if you find out five minutes into the, t <coughs> into the test that you're missing all this stuff, you may not have another chance with that user, so be ready. Always be very ready, be twice as ready as you think you need to be. Because you may not get another shot with that particular user. Uh, the previous questioner, you mean the interviews we did? The screening. No, 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 the, the previous screening and whatever questions you want to ask before they start uh, working. Ah, uh, so before the mm -hmm. real uh, screening. Yes, you may also want to have... Uh, I'm not doing that, it's, it's written on the material, I'm skipping that part because it's not as common. For some evaluations, you may want to also have some questions about their preconceptions. What do you think about dating software? What do you think about elderly software? And then they do the test and then you ask again the same questions and you have like pre and post answers. That may or may not fit in your research. That may or may not make sense for your uh, design. And so you're finally ready. It's the day, you have the user, you have your environment, you have your laptops, and you're going to be running the evaluation. Uh, the idea is, I already mentioned this at the beginning of the class, the user is going to be working there, and you're going to be there observing, and being very anxious, and freaking out, is the software going to fail, is the user going to understand it, is my design good enough? Uh, and you will be angry at times, like, are you an idiot? It's a big, badass red button, how I, in the world you cannot see it? That's human, that's normal. Uh, so what to do during the experience? In fact, the very one thing that is important, that is relevant, uh, is trying to convince the user, and it's very useful, is if you can convince the users to speak throughout the entire thing. This is called the think aloud technique, and it's just telling the user, okay, keep saying what you're thinking, what you want to do, what you're seeing on screen, and what are your feelings towards what you're seeing on screen. Why do we do this? Anyone there? Uh, Any big challenges that were difficult? So here are a couple of ideas. Go ahead. Uh, because it's more easy, it's easier to know the, uh, the mental process of the user mm -hmm. interacting with our product. So you can learn how, uh, how he or she thinks about our software and what are the mm -hmm. different scenarios he's thinking about it and then try to, to know hmm. how can it we, we did have a word for that, right? We call that something. And it was a challenge to figure it out. Something like the mental model mental of the users. So we want to get a glimpse into the mental models 
of the users. Because we said, we want to make applications that adapt to the mental model of the user. How do we know what's the mental model of the user? Well, we don't. But if the user is speaking out loud, we may get a glimpse into their current mental model and their expectations. Uh, and when something goes wrong, we get some notions of why this thing went wrong. If you remember, when we were speaking about perception, we spoke about mental models, and we also spoke about the execution and evaluation goals. And they were different sources for a problem. If the user just messes up the application and gets lost, and he was silent, it's more difficult to figure out whether this was an execution or an evaluation goal. That is, they are speaking out loud. When something goes wrong, we will have an idea of why it went wrong, and maybe, with some luck, how to fix it. So that's the point. It also helps the user focus on the task and be very reflective about what they're doing. And I have this here on the advantages list, but this is also a key disadvantage. Why? Who? Again, who dares? It's not a common situation. Yeah, so, if, so here. If you, your app, for example, has not a um, server posture, and that will force the server posture on them. Actually, yes, that's a brilliant response, more elaborated than my previous point. Heightened attention maybe higher than the real thing that they're going to have. It's a mobile app that they're going to be checking in class, for example, even if they're standing on the first row. Uh, you are in a slightly different setting. You are completely immune to <laughs> subtlety. <laughs> and, but yes, the idea is heightened attention, and also they're going more slowly. And they are being very reflecting and thinking slowly about the stuff. And that's not from the, what's going to happen in the real world. So uh, where is this? Here. They're going more slowly and therefore making less mistakes. And they're paying more attention than in a natural setting. So I may be missing out some information. However, in general, I will argue it's worth it. The, the stuff, the information, all the data that you get from the think aloud technique, it's completely worth that disadvantage. But it's strange for some people. For some users, you need to be all the time like pulling the words out of them. It's, we're not used to just speaking in a continuous stream of mind. There are some users that are naturals for this, that they sit down and they give you like ultra valuable information in just the 10 more minutes you've learned more about your application than in the 10 previous users throughout their entire session. And there are others that are very shy and quiet and it's very difficult to extract useful information for them. Uh, so that's a disadvantage with some participants. Also, it's far more tiring than you may imagine. You can do an evaluation, a one-hour evaluation with a user, no trouble. But if it's a one-hour evaluation with Think Aloud, that's way too much. Regular humans are not used to speaking through an entire hour. Just try it out. Uh, not having a conversation, but a continuous stream. I mean, I do, but I get paid for it. And, I still struggle sometimes. <clears throat> so some pieces of advice. If you're going to do Think Aloud, this is one of those kind of open-ended art forms where there are many moderators and many teams that have like their own tricks. So at least some advice, six pieces of advice. First, do explain the technique well. Do not just say, I want you to speak all the time. And they are like, mm, I wonder if I'm going to go shopping after completing this evaluation. That's not really useful. Explain what you have and explain precisely and be open about this. I want to figure out your expectations about my application. And if something went, goes wrong, I want to know why. So just give that information. Do not hold to that information. It's useful. What to do when they remain silent? You actually should prod them. If they've been too long without saying anything and they keep interacting, just insist, like, hey, please do remember that I want you to, to do this. Yeah. But if you explain to them that you want them to speak, doesn't that create a sense of I have to do it well in the user? Yes, yes, we will be actually going there. It, it increases the pressure. Not, in, not only because of that, but remember there's a camera pointed at him, and that's creating some anxiety. And the more you open about what's going on in your mind, the more exposed you are, and that's slightly freak out the, the users. Yes, that's an issue. Wasn't that in my disadvantages list? Uh, it's been. Oh. Oh, okay, so it's actually a typo. It makes them feel more observed. 
not observant. My apologies for that. So, yeah, it's a disadvantage. Uh, however, I did say what happens when your users remain silent, uh, but sound management, if I may, is actually rather important because wherever a user, if a user is continuous, all users are always speaking and there's one point at which, in which all of them go silent, that's probably relevant. That probably means that's a point that requires heightened attention, so they're suddenly increasing their focus and that's why they're shutting up. So that may be very relevant. You want to note those. The moderator, you were mentioning, so should the moderator be right there, should he be in, an, in a different room? Do you know what that means, Fadic language? Yes. Okay, so there's a Wikipedia link on the actual materials. The FADIC function of language is what you do on a phone conversation when you're or in a conversation with someone and you're like saying like, aha, uh -huh, yes, I see. That's the FADIC function of language. You don't care. No, you, you show that the channel is open. So that's the formal definition. You are letting your counterpart know that the communication is happening and you're listening, even if they're telling a very long story. If they're telling you a very long story, one of your friends, and you just like blank out like this, they may not be sure if you're paying attention. So if you want to show that you're paying attention or you want to pretend that you're paying attention, both of them work, you use the FADIC function of language. That's, and that's important for the moderator. Uh -huh. that, precisely. So. Do you know about the FADIC tones on your phones? No. FADIC white nose on your phone calls? Have you ever noticed? So uh, modern telephony, when you're speaking on the phone, be it a landline or be it a mobile phone, this is pure digital, okay? So there is no background noise by definition. There's no static. When you're doing, a, especially on your mobile phone, when you're doing a conversation, your carrier is injecting a little bit of white noise in your phone so that you are aware that the phone is working. That's the FADIC function of the channel. You've noticed this, even unconsciously. Yeah. You're speaking, and you are the one who's talking, and suddenly you hear like more silence than expected on the other side because the, the call was dropped. And you notice because your carrier was injecting white noise on your, on your phone. Try to listen to it the, the next time. And try to figure out, I mean, traditionally on your phones that will work because that, there will be copper everywhere and this was analog and there was natural noise, but there's no longer natural noise when you're speaking on a mobile phone. It's 100% digital. There's no signal noise anywhere. It's being intentionally injected into your phone call. And that's a FADIC function. Uh, also Skype includes these. No, Skype just adds. Yeah, for that reason I'm just asking like, no, yeah, I'm not, no. <coughs> yeah I'm not, I don't think Skype does. I'm not entirely sure. I have never noticed. Maybe not. WhatsApp doesn't. And it's just slightly creeping out. You're all the time like, are you there? Are you there? Uh, because they're not doing yeah. it. I'm not sure about Skype. But your regular phone call does it. So you may not learn anything about usability, but you learn a lot about your mobile phones here. Also, I already mentioned this on the interviews, leverage silence. Silence is not good, but the user says, oh, so how I do it? And you just resist the temptation to answer immediately. And that will generate a need on the user to feel that silence, depending on whether it's a normal person or a psychopath. Uh, that's up to you to measure and balance. And also, uh, so yeah, you first. We should tell the user what we are expecting from there. Like, we want you to, I don't know, to know the data for this girl. You do that at the beginning. You, yeah. you lay out so the you rules know, and what you... Like, what you want the user to do. Yeah, either in the shape of tasks or scenarios. And what about if the application is controlled by the voice? Uh-huh. Uh, is this possible to make this kind of uh, evaluations? So if it's going, if it's real, I mean, if it's really working the application, it's a challenge to separate the two... Well, no. Even in your case, it's not a challenge. I was going to say that typically since the system is not working, you're doing a Wizard of Oz type of thing. So it's up to the human operator to figure out whether they were speaking out loud or trying to make an actual command for the system. In your case, you do want your system to be able to distinguish between commands and regular conversation with their counterpart. So you are kind of in the same situation. So if it doesn't work and it's a Wizard of Oz uh, evaluation, it's up to the human operator. If your system is working, your system should be able to figure it out. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah. 
If you're in none of the cases. In, in this case, we should have someone just in the background hmm. that that's, moves through the That's network. the wizard of, of us. And that's the human operator making those decisions. Do take a look at the, do review the prototyping and testing with prototypes uh, section. Uh, one missing, oh, no one went to give up. I have had personal experiences with users that was, it was impossible. It was a, remember to speak, oh, oh, yes. I'm trying to do this. And they went silent. Remember, please, to tell me what you're thinking. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Some more silence. Please do remember. At some point, you're just pushing the user so much, you're not getting any useful information, and you're just freaking them out, and they're not going to speak. So it's like, oh, OK, never mind. Just keep going. Do not speak. The user is already sitting down in front of your software, so make the most of it. And even if you do not have think aloud, at least do have the recordings and just stop insisting at some point. Not easy. Really, not easy. Really try it. Really try to experience this in first person. I've done a lot of this, and it's not easy. That's, that's the summary. It's very challenging. Some more advice. So what's my feeling when I'm doing one of these? You're always feeling like that, okay? So it's incredibly frustrating for the moderator. You do want to just snap the user's head off or something like that. It's, you're desperate, you freak out, you're very angry. Uh, you typically feel like that, but it shouldn't show. It's, not, it's up to you not to let this be noticeable. So some words or some reflections about the moderator's attitude. The moderator should be encouraging and just prompt the users to explore. If the user is lost, oh, I don't know how to do this, you either go quiet and say nothing, or you just say, try to explore. And you just prompt them, like, do not look at me. I'm not going to help you out. Come on, get on your feet and run. Uh, try to prevent the users from feeling observed. I mean, you are looking at them. You are recording their face. You are recording the screen. And there may be a few observers in the room with you. Do try them not to feel too absurd. How? Well, just engage in a conversation, just the moderator's role. And one of the advantages of having the moderator sit nearby the user is that the moderator can play this role of turning the, this into a conversation with the moderator rather than an actual experiment, even though it's, of course, an actual experiment. Wait, wait a second. Yeah. <coughs> sure. Out of battery. So the, on the moderator's attitude, the, this is the role, this is what the moderator should be doing. Uh, some good practices for hiding that internal desperation that you will be feeling as a moderator. Try not to show surprise in any of the directions. I mean, negative surprise, a what the fuck? It's not going to help your user feel at ease. But then, positive surprise, oh, that was great that you found that. That's contaminating the experiment. That's, uh, that's, uh, tampering with the user expectations and the user appreciation. So do not do that again. If you're going to try to extract some information from the user, what you want to have is information about the user's mental model and expectations. So if you intervene in some way with the user, try that to be always in the direction of, tell me more of what you're thinking, tell me more of what you expect to find, and try to, be, uh, to extract as much information as you can, if you decide that it's good for the moderator to intervene. If the moderator is going to intervene and ask questions, try to not ask direct questions. Uh, for example, why the hell did you press that button? That's not a good question. Uh, uh, and here, you can be honest, and you can just have like, like be very generic and open-ended. Like the user just clicked on something that was dramatically impossible that the user thought that that was an appropriate action. It's, the user just did the stupidest thing ever. Rather than asking this, is well, how are you doing? and try to get some insight into why he did that very stupid thing. Or my personal favorite, this is Black Hat moderating. Oh, I missed that. Could you explain what you just did? Uh, you, of course, you saw that perfectly. It was just the stupidest thing ever. But you do not want the user to know that you're thinking that. So tricks. Maintain a relaxed tone. And this is also <coughs> important. 
Try not to be all the time looking for solutions. You're, you're the, you're, the moderator is typically part of the development team. You know the software, you know the design, you know your rationale. You see the user failing and you're immediately like, oh, I should put that button over there and I should be doing that. Refrain from that. It's going to contaminate you and the test. There will be a moment for that later on. Try not to focus in that, into that right now. And when to intervene, when to actually help, not just prompt and nudge and give nice words. Well, basic rule. The moderator should never intervene to help a user. The moderator will not be there when the software is up there. Uh, anytime the moderator helps the user, a common guy pressed there, you've just contaminated the experiment because you wouldn't be there in normal reasons. But sometimes you actually need to do that. When do you need to do that? Well, for example, a user may be helplessly lost. It's important. I mean, this, this, this guy is never going to get out of here. He just dug himself. Uh, so badly into the hole, he's not going to get out of there without my help. So you actually do intervene. Like, okay, so I see that you're lost, I'm going to give you some more information. When you do that, it's important, I mean, it's important that you do that because you want the user to finish and to go through other tasks, but it's important for you to note that you did that. Because that, I mean, your system is clearly broken. That user will have been lost for your system forever if you weren't there observing him. So you will need to change that because that's hopelessly losing some users. So you just unlock the situation, just help the user out and take a note. So here I contaminated the test, I had to help the user. And you will figure out later how to avoid that. Also if the user is becoming increasingly frustrated. I've seen that. I've, I had that. I have, I've had users walk out from my experiments. They were volunteers and it was, they were finding it extremely frustrating to use the, the system. It was on this very same uh, system for elderly people and he was like, ah, I'm getting too frustrated, I don't want to keep doing this. I'm standing up. And he actually stood up and left. So do feel free to intervene before that happens because you just lost a lot of money, effort, and so on if the user stood up. It happens. So if the user is very frustrated, help him out. Help them through the entire thing. Try to see the end with them, with your help. It will be contaminated. It will not be authentic. It's better than the user standing up and leave. Um, also, there may be gaps on your prototypes. If something is not implemented, it, there, that's not a contamination. It's perfectly appropriate that you intervene there and say, so this is not done, this is what you will see, and then you will be on this other screen. And you just like jump over that hole in your, in your system with the help of the moderator. That's acceptable. And whenever something goes wrong with your software, because something will go wrong with your software. So you just intervene there, because you're obviously going to fix that before you launch. Aren't you?